rainy evening. Thanks for making it out to join us. I'm Mary Louise Helbig. Most people call me ML. I'm the executive director of I-10. And for those of you who may not be familiar with us, we're a nonprofit organization that's been in the St. Louis ecosystem for 11 years. And our focus is to help uh, tech startups. We work with those companies um, free for <laughs> We don't charge them for the programs and services we provide to them, and we help them uh, validate and commercialize their tech innovation because what we want to do is support uh, startup companies in the St. Louis region to create new ventures um, that uh, bring new innovation to the region and support our economy. We're approaching uh, having worked with and supported almost a thousand tech startups in the St. Louis region, and uh, we're very proud of that. We're going to be uh, very soon, we're counting the numbers, but announcing our 11, our 1,000, 1,000 uh, startup. Maybe by the end of the year. So, um, major milestone upcoming for us. Thank you for joining us this evening. Um, our topic this evening is on funding and the funding roadmap. And one of the things you might know as an entrepreneur or understand and appreciate is that funding is a very important resource to them, to their ability to commercialize and scale their business. But it's a tricky roadway. And um, you've really got to know how to navigate it effectively in order to uh, identify the right funding sources for you and engage those funding resources um, at the right time for your uh, business. Um, very happy to have uh, Mark Raffinini with us tonight from Kara Stone. Uh, and I um, want to thank him for joining us tonight, uh, but also uh, Claire Tillman, who's in the back of the room. Uh, his associate and colleague. Uh, Kara Stone has been a great sponsor and supporter of I-10. Uh, some of you may have seen um, they've uh, helped us launch the digital version of our ecosystem map. People love our ecosystem map. I see some of the back of the room looking at it. Um, but once you print something, it's out of date, right? So since we launched that map and with Kara Stone's support, the digital map is live and in real time and current, and also provides additional layers of information as you drill down um, about the companies. We have an info table up by the bar. If you have a major way up there to see it, it's up there. So um, that's just a <laughs> little sampling of the companies and the resources that are available to entrepreneurs in the St. Louis region, kind of by category. So funding, co-working space, edu entrepreneur education, technical training, etc. So if you haven't, um, Check it out, please do, it's on our website. Um, and as I mentioned, Mark uh, Graffinini is with us. Um, I'm gonna start off and talk about just kind of the framework for what entrepreneurs, it's important for entrepreneurs to understand about fundraising and who and when it's appropriate to talk to different people, kind of the key considerations you should have. And then Mark's uh, organization, Kara Stone, has done um, a report on Missouri Venture and is gonna share some additional insights, and particularly around data and how um, data is really important. Understanding, again, how to use information and figure out who you should be talking to and when if you're going to be raising money. So um, one of the things that happens at I-10 is we onboard companies every month. We uh, onboard roughly 75 new companies each year. And um, it's so predictable, I will say, that um, the companies that come in at that monthly onboarding session, and the first thing they say to us is, I have this great idea and I want to talk to VCs. And we say, that's great you have a great idea, but now is not the time for you to be talking to VCs. So um, one of the things we like to point out to them that um, the reality of getting money from venture capitalists is, is a challenge, and it's not for everyone. It's also not the right thing for everyone to do. But less than six percent, less than one, Less than 1% of startup companies actually get VC funding. And also, 81% of entrepreneurs never get either VC funding or money from a traditional bank. Um, and so where is all that VC money going? Because it sure sounds like there's all this money out there flying around and it's kind of free and clear for everybody. Well, it's not. Because when you look at the numbers, Less than 1% of money goes into rural communities, of entrepreneurs from rural com communities. Only 1% goes to African American and Latino founders. And actually less than 2% goes, whoops, actually less than 2% goes to uh, women founders. 
Um, and so where is all that money going? It's largely going to the coast, California, New York, and, and Boston. So, um, but that doesn't mean that's a terrible ending to the story. Um, what it means is there are other sources of funding, and it also means that you should understand what they are, when it's appropriate for you to be talking to them and engaging with them, and that relates to the stage your company is in and how much money you're seeking. So um, when we talk about then key types of funding, um, and this is, I'm, I'm putting this in a nice little package, um, but this is, consider this framing, right? So nothing in the world is perfect, but as a framework, these are things to consider. So when we think of types of funding, um, a good thing to do is to start to think about it in relation to what stage your startup is at in the commercialization process and also how much money you are seeking or asking for. And so at the very early stages, most entrepreneurs start out bootstrapping. And that means they're self-funding. Basically the money's coming out of your wallet, whether it's coming out of your savings account, uh, whether it's on a credit card, um, that's bootstrapping. And some companies bootstrap all the way through, but that's really one of the earliest stages of funding. Um, another one, then once you get beyond yourself and probably drain all your personal reserves, people move on to uh, extend their circle to friends and family. And following that, um, even a broader community um, is crowdfunding for really the early sta earlier stages. And then um, stepping out even farther would be contests and accelerators like Bumsel's Accelerator right across the hall, Capital Innovators, Arch Grants, things like that. And grants, SBIR, SDTR is an opportunity of, of for some larger scale grants um, and dollars. So you're starting to get into the hundreds of thousands of dollars perhaps. And then moving into the, the bigger dollars, say like two million and beyond, is when you start to talk about Series A and working with venture capital firms. And beyond that would be private equity. Private equity isn't going to talk to you unless you have an established business um, that is profitable and doing well and can even scale beyond that. And then the ultimate end game, and I'm not saying this is where everybody needs to go and the pathway everybody needs to follow, but over time and the stages that you progress through and the amounts of money you need at the farthest end of the spectrum would be a public offering through an IPO. So putting this kind of all into, um, because from our perspective and our, what I would call our members or clients perspective for entrepreneurs is, what does this really look like when you're launching a business? So, yes sir. I have a question. Do uh, you have a trend on crowdsourcing and, and doesn't crowdsourcing, um, it's not, it's not necessarily geographic. So you had said the money, those venture capitalists in California now, you know, or not venture capitalists, excuse me, people that invest via crowdsourcing, they can be anywhere. If your sure. idea is in St. Louis. Yes. Do you have any kind of metrics or trend on that? Um, well, I wasn't prepared to answer that one tonight. I don't know if you have anything top of mind, but um, I mean, I can tell you, characteristically, you're right, that crowdfunding, you, you know, anybody can participate on the platform, whatever platform they might use, so they could be from anywhere as far as geographical participation. Um, but um, also know that crowdfunding has tended to do better for products that are more consumer-oriented products because that's kind of the marketplace and what people can relate to and kind of the way you can set up the programs. It's not exclusive to that, but tends towards that. Um, and then the rounds are usually, I would say, on you know, typically on the lower end, it's typically pre VC stuff. I mean, there's some people that have blown it out of the water, but again, they're more the exception than the rule. So I don't know if that really answers your question. It helps. Okay. We'll see. Maybe maybe we'll get further to it in a minute. So. Um, um, but looking at this, so uh, when we talk about um, the financial stages of the company, you know, when you're building a business and you're an idea stage, this is where you're burning money, right? I mean, you, don't, you haven't started generating revenue yet, you haven't gotten there. And as you move through the valley of death through proof of concept and you put and have a product that you put in the market, um, maybe customers aren't paying yet, but then they start to pay, but you move then towards your break-even break point. Um, so prior to that is your valley of death, and this is, this is a tough time and a tough road. 
And so thinking about this, what I'm going to try to show you here, just again, very for, for a framework, very structurally, is when you're thinking about raising money, your key considerations are what stage are you at? And so we're looking at it from that perspective. And then how much money can you raise at those stages? And so when you look at the funding amounts, these are just kind of, for point of reference, kind of buckets you can consider. So you're in idea stage, you're likely not going to raise $10 million from investors at this point. Okay, so that's what this is, is basically trying, trying to show. I will say too that, um, that it's important to note that we are in the Midwest and investors in the Midwest behave differently than investors on the coasts too. So it's a really important to understand um, not only about who you are, where you are, and what kind of money that you can potentially seek, and Mark's going to talk a little bit more about this too, um, but that the investment community in the Midwest behaves a little bit differently than those on the coast. And um, so again, it's, it's knowing your audience. Anybody in the room in sales have been in sales in their career? Yeah, yeah. So raising money is very much a sales process. And so people who have been in sales, I think, appreciate the fact that knowing who your customer is, how to target them, when to talk to them, keeping them engaged is all part of the, um, all part of the process. Okay, so now we layer in the sources of funding, right? So now, if you think about what stage is my business at, what amount of money am I typically able to go out and seek at this stage, and who can I go ask? So again, it's, you know, this is not the end all and be all, but it is a framework and probably just a good framework to keep in mind for what is currently going on in the investment community. Any questions? Okay. So I, I kind of started on this when I asked the sales question, but fundraising requires effort and, and discipline and work. You don't decide today that you're just going to, you know what, I think I need to go out and start raising money. You have to have a strategy, you have to have a plan, and you have to be prepared to do it. And so just like in sales, um, when you're going to go out and raise money, you probably ought to start getting ready for that process at least, at least six months in advance. Um, and I see around the room some of our companies and founders in the room who could probably um, share some very... Uh, poignant stories and, and real life experiences about that. But, um, you know, just like a customer, when you talk to an investor, make sure you know what their investment criteria is because they have it. So they're going to tell you what kind of industry they they invest in. I mean, it's probably on their website, honestly. They're going to tell you at what stage they're interested in talking to you, you know, how much they typically invest in rounds. Um, and so you got to know who you're going to be selling to and you got to cultivate and create that pipeline and that contact list. Um, timing is everything because guess what? They could be a perfect investment opportunity for you, but maybe they don't have, maybe they're not investing right now. You know, they don't, they don't have an open round and they're investing. So, it, you know, it's, that's like everything in life, right? Timing is everything. Um, and then developing those relationships and, and fostering those relationships. It's not just going to be one phone call, can I have a meeting? Sure, come on in. You know, it's going to take time to develop and cultivate those relationships. And just like with your clients uh, as customers, you know, you market to them. You, you don't just call them up one day and say, have a meeting with me. They might say no, but guess what? You probably ought to start sending them updates about your business or if there's a key milestone that occurs. So you've got, you've got to keep them engaged and their attention on you. And, and make sure they know when you're making progress and you're moving forward. It becomes a whole marketing plan that goes around this. And then be prepared. So if you're going to go out and you say, all right, I'm going to need to start raising money in, say, six months, there's pre-work you have to do. Because if you pick up the phone and call someone, and surprisingly someone says, sure, let's talk, and you have that conversation, you have to be prepared to have that conversation. You have to know what your key points are that you're going to make. What is your ask? 
uh, it, it's just like, again, a sales process. So uh, and at the end of the call, they're probably going to say to you, great, this was, this was great. Send me your deck or send me your executive summary. Do you have that on hand? Because if you don't, and it's a scramble to go create that, you don't want them waiting a week or three days to get the information from you. So there's a lot of things that you need to do to prepare for starting this process. And that includes having presentation materials already on hand and ready to just, you know, download and send uh, following that call. Um, and remember that it is a process. You're not going to close the sale after one meeting. It's going to take multiple meetings and multiple presentations with each investor. So don't, don't think it's a, I got the meeting and we're good to go. Um, because typically the way it works is that that person is a screener and they're going to take that information and take it back and look at it and share it and then they're going to get more questions, they're going to come back to you with more questions, they might need another call. So it could require multiple meetings, phone calls, and sharing of information. And that's why the deal room is really important. If you set up a deal room <coughs> in advance, then you have all that information just sitting there ready and you can pull it from there, whether it's an executive summary, uh, you know, a video, um, your pitch deck, whatever. Uh, you can just pull it from there and shoot it out to them. So um, with that, I'm going to invite Mark up, um, Mark Graffini from Kara Stone. And he is going to talk to you about um, really why fundraising is a data-driven process, both from the standpoint of understanding who to target and who you should be engaging in your process and understanding them as potential partners and also understanding your business and what you need to know about your business in order to make an effective ask. Thank you. Okay. Hey everyone, thank you. I'm excited to be here. So I, I got caught up in technology uh, probably around 15 years ago. I had some friends that were living in Silicon Valley. They got really into this new thing called nanotechnology, which was making the world, you know, revolutionizing the world's products and processes and from an engineering and technology standpoint. So I ended up getting roped into editing a book on the subject that was published, and then we started a, a law and business journal that was published on nanotechnology. The patent office ended up licensing a lot of our articles about it to create the nanotechnology patent classification. So that led me eventually to Silicon Valley, where uh, I practiced a lot at the top firm, a firm called Wilson Sincini, um, which represented everybody from Apple to Google uh, and everyone in between. I, I just became, I guess, obsessed and, and really passionate about uh, companies raising money, scaling, and exiting. And so uh, I'm originally from New Orleans, and I had heard my family and friends say, you, know, you really ought to take a look at what's going on here. There's a lot of new companies moving to New Orleans, and they think it's cool, and they're starting up all this stuff. And I really was pretty dismissive of it. I was in the center of, of the universe as far as venture capital is concerned. Uh, but when I went home, I, I really became pretty convinced that there were some real big changes happening around the country. And that was that places like New Orleans, St. Louis, Memphis, Nashville, places that have high, high culture and low hassle to me, uh, and also kind of a lower cost of living, were becoming cool again. And that there were a lot of people that were moving back from the coast, and there was a lot of momentum towards supporting entrepreneurs. So I said, well, I think I can help at least at home and help kind of adapt some of the concepts from Silicon Valley uh, to places that weren't in Silicon Valley. So I've spent the better part of 10 years now doing just that. And, and a couple highlights are that I think uh, we've helped non-Silicon Valley companies raise over a billion dollars in that time period. So we do over 20 deals that are in the earlier uh, stage, so series C to A, convertible to say something, which is a pretty staggering amount for any single group that's outside of Silicon Valley. We've done uh, over a billion dollars of exits for non-Silicon Valley companies, including last year one of the highest profile non-Silicon Valley tech company IPOs, which is my client Waiter, which raised $28 million from individuals, uh, no institutional venture capital money, and then did uh, a reverse merger IPO. So I'm here to say that even though there might not be as much capital invested in a place like St. Louis uh, or Missouri generally, there's a lot of capital here, there's a lot of capital elsewhere, and that there are a lot of commonalities between these smaller markets that can lead to a successful fundraising strategy. But like every other market, whether it's the stock market or something else, fundamentally, markets work on information and data. And I think that 
the fundraising process is exactly that, it's a process. It's not event driven, based on Shark Tank style demo days or pitch contests. It's not intro based, contrary to what you might think. Uh, I've either represented or have represented companies taking investment from every marquee name in Silicon Valley and on the East Coast. In an email saying that you're a great founder and that your company is really cool does not get companies funded and it often doesn't get meetings unless there's something uh, much more substantial behind that. And I also think fundraising is not really based on philanthropy. So like I said, in a lot of these markets there are a lot of uh, philanthropic efforts that are devoted towards nurturing ecosystems, but when it comes down to actually getting money in the bank and dealing with investors, it's fundamentally driven by metrics uh, beyond a certain stage. So we try to help companies take a, basically a data-driven approach because there's usually a misalignment between expectations and reality. And you know, again, if you look at a, if you look at Missouri as a market for venture and angel capital, uh, from 2011 to 2019, you know, we count about 632 deals. So that's about 60 to 80 deals on average of all stages in that market. Um, we peg the number around 1.6 billion dollars worth of capital raised, and about 200, you know, 195 million or so raised in any given year. So there is capital out there. It's just how do you become that? You know, one of the companies in that number of 0.6%. And I think one of the starting places is by looking at your average and median deal size in a particular market. Uh, it's my personal view that the most critical time in a company's fundraising life cycle is that part of the graph that Mary Louise showed that, that has the, the proof of concept to launch stage. And there's a wide number in there. It says 200,000 to two million dollars. And what I see more often than not do companies is when they go to market seeking too much money in any given round in that period. So there are a number of companies that will go to market in uh, in a place like St. Louis or even in New Orleans or anywhere else outside of Silicon Valley and they've become convinced by blog posts and what they heard from their friend in New York or Silicon Valley that you should be doing a million dollar seed round. And while that is possible, if you look at check sizes in these individuals markets, they range from anywhere between $25,000 or so to $55,000. So in, in Louisiana, I can say with almost absolute certainty, the average check size is $55,000. And for you to raise a million dollar round from you know, non-institutional angel investors would mean you'd have to get almost all of those, you'd have to get a substantial proportion of those check writers into your round at that stage. So oftentimes, we say, look, Take a look at something like our report. We, we published some data at vc.carestone.com. If you look at St. Louis or Missouri as an overall market, the average deal size, which includes really small deals of $100,000 all the way up to $50 million later stage deals, is $2.6 million. So if you're a pre-launch company seeking $1.5 million in a given round, just mentally you've ha you have to jump to the conclusion that you are so exceptional uh, as a rule, because that, that average is bumped up by those big later stage rounds, that you are likely to be able to raise that round. We often find that companies that are not. So you, you do another checkpoint in the process. You say, what is the overall median? The median round size means the most, you know, the most commonly raised round is actually around 750,000. So the majority of the companies are out there doing deals, in any particular deal. That's probably a better indicator than whatever blog post you read related to Silicon Valley, different country deal size, or even these mass market conglomeration studies. So I think, you know, for that core group of, of companies that are in that early, early stage, thinking about how to raise a smaller round around concrete metrics that demonstrate or go to scalability, just make you much more credible with the later stage investors where you start getting six-figure type checks rather than those double-digit types. And these change by average, by industry, by the way. So we'll, we'll talk about that in a little bit. But for example, if you look at ag tech deals, the average size deal is about $6 million. In biotech, it's about 3.6. In mobile tech, on the other hand, like mobile apps, things like that, it's about 700,000. In SaaS, uh, it's 2.2 million on average. So um, you know, when you read articles about the national market or you talk to your friends on the coast, and they say, well, I hear that, you know, the way it's done is that companies raise $6.5 million before their Series A, and they do the Series A of this size. Most of the time, it's just not true. Um, and those numbers are often inflated by really large deals from repeat founders. 
And the, the reality is that those are not representative of really how most of the deals outside of the coast are getting done these days. And investors that are looking on the coast that look at the companies in the rest of the country often want you to be more capital efficient than what they see in their own, their own markets as well. So those are a couple data points on, on how to use that. Another thing that it is a stark contrast between Silicon Valley and um, you know, non-Silicon Valley markets is thoughts around corporate structure. So in Silicon Valley, if someone had come to us and said, we want to start as an LLC and we're going to do, you know, that's going to be our company structure and then we'll flip it at some point, we really probably would not have taken them as a client because there's almost no venture deal that gets done uh, under an LLC for a period of time. It just not happened. It's not really up for debate. In more St. Louis markets and New Orleans and Texas, all these other places that we do, uh, Tennessee, places where we do a lot of work, there's a little more give here. There are investor groups that are totally okay with you being an LLC. There are founders that say we like a pass through tax losses because we have other jobs and we want to offset our income. But in any given year, we personally do between five, probably, and ten uh, corporate reorganizations where we take the LLC and convert it to corporation in order to, to get the Series A done. And the you know there are a lot of reasons why that's more beneficial. If you're a growth company that's looking at doing an M&A or an IPO exit, you're foregoing potentially massive tax benefits by not being a corporation. So if you're a corporation, you have qualified small business stock, which means that at, at your exit, you get to exclude $10 million worth of capital gain uh, that are, that's distributed in consideration of that stock. And that's, you say to yourself, well, that's not even possible. But last year, had I had our company that went public last year, within a five-year period, too, if they had started off as an LLC and waited, they would have lost that holding period. And the founders would have had you know, $3.7 million in tax on the closing consideration alone. So you know, the way I look at this is easy. If you are a mobile app company, a SaaS company, any kind of, some certain kinds of consumer goods companies, certain, you know, certainly biotech, if you are going to play the venture capital game, or you're going you're to go through the progression and seek institutional capital, or look at one of these kinds of exits, you will have to do this sooner or later. I just don't care what anybody says. So the 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 reality is, you might want to think about earlier to make sure you don't lose that. And in this market alone, 58 percent of deals are Delaware corporations, and they raise 80 percent of the capital overall. So it's just not statistically, it's not really. Even much. But I think there was a question. Yeah, I was just going to ask, it seems like there's, uh, even when you look at Delaware C Corp, there's a lot of different paths to get there. And if you use a service like Clerky or something, would that, would, you, would there be a red flag there? Would that be a good thing? Or what, kind of what's your take on that? Yeah, honestly, there are a lot of good services out there to do formations these days. And so um, you'll have, you'll find a lot of people that, I mean, I have a, I'm a partner of venture capital firm. I'm also a lawyer. You, you'll find a lot of lawyers who don't use the pre can stuff. To me, it, the, the, I mean, I don't want to uh, say anything bad. I, I, I don't get freaked out. Like, I, I look at the pre can documents that people generate, and we focus mainly on these, you know, later seed and then bigger deals following. So I think you get it set up in a cost effective manner, do your education as a research. I always think it's a good idea for you to hire a lawyer because, in the end, when you're selling, when you're raising money, you're selling stock. So if you haven't made an investment, and the actual thing that you're selling to investors, it will get noticed. And nothing turns me off more uh, as an investor, it's a question I asked in the very first pitch meeting when I'm taking pitch meetings as an investor, is what's your corporate structure, what's the deal? And if someone says, you know, me and a founder are putting it all together, or no big deal, or we'll download, you know, the Cooley Go documents or the Clerky documents, there's like a million sources for this stuff, which is great. But there's traps in there too. And if you don't get your initial stock issuances right as a founder, if you don't file your 83B elections, you know, these are these are really, if you're successful, they're million dollar problems. Like, they're not little problems. They're, so like, it's no big deal if it never goes anywhere. But you want to play for, for the success and not have to turn it over. So, long answer to a very easy question is, yeah, I mean, I think it's important to invest properly, but I do think it's good to do it cost effectively. <laughs> so find somebody maybe to, to review them for cheap. But yeah, formation is certainly important. A couple other things uh, that you want to have here that are going to get asked for very quickly and that I think you need to just show that you know should be there. You need to have founder vesting in your documents. 
certainly employees need to be subject to vesting. Uh, your IP assignments all have to be clean. Those are, those are all kind of key things. And then you really need to do a careful analysis of your first couple rounds. There's another thing I think that gets glossed over. Originally, convertible note rounds and convertible instruments in generally were usually done as bridges between rounds. It was not standard, at least it wasn't so valued, that these were your first rounds because you avoid valuation things like that. In the recession, convertible notes with valuation caps started becoming more standard because companies had no leverage. So along the way, people said, those are cheaper and easier to do than seed round, and so you should do your note round. I see a lot of companies not properly look at this issue as well. So they end up doing a Series A where they have to raise a gargantuan amount of money at an extraordinarily high valuation that cannot be supported in the market, and it destroys the round. Where they'd be better off having taken smaller uh, amounts of money as an equity round and progressively increasing the valuation. So, that's again, it's not, there's no blog post you can read about what the right thing for you to do is because you're a SaaS company in this industry. This is a, um, you know, what I like to call a financing deal design process. It's going to be different for every company. It's going to relate to your pro forma and your actual execution metrics. And only in that way are you really going to be truly successful in the fundamental. And like I'm saying, a lot of this stuff does vary by industry. So. What's good for a seed stage company in one industry is not going to work necessarily for a seed stage company in another issue. If you, if you break this down, and this starts to really drive home that 0.6% number of only 0.6% of companies raised venture capital. If you look at SaaS deals in the Missouri market, for example, um, it looks like there's about 25 of those deals per year. The highest that we saw was 39 deals in the SaaS category during 2017. So really what you're talking about if you're raising money in a given year in a market like this is that to get funding around done, you're going to be one of 25 total deals. And even that's not the right number because that includes late stage, mid stage, early stage. So you're talking about a very low number of companies that end up being successful raising money in any particular industry. If you look at other ones, it's even more sobering. So if you're a mobile app company, there are about 10 deals per year, 12 total deals being the highest. And then if you're looking at biotech, there are about 15 deals per year. The highest we looked at is about 22. So uh, each of these also have different average and median deal size. So like in SaaS, the median deal size is around a million, the average being 2.25, I think we mentioned that before. In mobile apps, you see a median of around 275. And this gets back to my point of, you know, a lot of companies these days are going to want to look at $250,000 rounds to seven fifty, dollars and try to be really efficient with the capital and make sure they're driving out particular metrics. So if you're a pre-seed company, generally speaking, and again, you have to sit down with someone and design, do financing deal design here so you're successful. But I would say some things to look at are if you're, if you're pre-seed, you need to, at least to me, have gone down and well-documented your progression through the lean startup hypothesis testing methodology. So if you're raising money, I mean, if, you're, if you know people that believe in you and your product, then you're, you may raise money from them. They may not press you too hard. But as you get away from your personal network, it becomes more about data and information, convincing people that you've done your matter. And one of those things might be a large number of customer interviews, explaining how much customer feedback was in the product development process explaining how even though you don't have a full process or product completed, you've done enough alpha beta testing and customer acquisition strategy to a sophisticated landing stage. All of these kinds of things are, are, are really crucial. The good founders that end up getting funded through the progression start there. If you're a seed company uh, that has at least some version of a product launch, you definitely need user data. There's just no way around it. So we get a lot of companies that come to us when they're running out of their seed capital and they basically have a few months left and they're like, we need to do a $1.5 million round, that gets us to break even. And so I ask really easy questions. What kinds of user acquisition strategies have you done? Have you, have you, what, what is your alpha beta testing data show on which kinds of users come? What is your churn rate? What are your mega users doing on the site and what features are they using? If companies do not have that data, 
and they only have a month left to raise money. It, that $1.5 million round just won't happen. There's, no, there's nothing that can be done at that point. So as you're, again, doing your initial round, I think it's really important to sit down with people that have been in hundreds of pitch meetings, or at least a lot of pitch meetings, and know the metrics that will be looked at along each of these stages so you can spend the money wisely. It's not just going to you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars, product development that hasn't been informed about. Uh, for a Series A investor, the fund I'm affiliated with, I mean, there are just hard metrics in the core screening criteria for someone to even get a meeting. So if you are a SaaS company, for example, you'll have to be doing at least one to two million dollars in revenue a year, have a high year over year growth rate in terms of both revenue and user acquisition, and you'll have to be in an industry that has a very high growth rate as well. So, you know, something like market research that may be growing at 8% a year versus food delivery that may be growing at 60, 70% a year, those are gonna be evaluated much differently. So you need to look at your company metrics, but then you need to look at your industry and peer metrics as well, and then, if you are, are, are an app that's looking at multiple locations, for example, you will be judged by investors on how quickly you're launching and growing each market cohort. So we get a lot of people that make this mistake. They say, if I only get 1% of these 10 markets, then we'll be on, we'll be really good. But they haven't learned enough about the single first market that they've launched to really be able to replicate and scale in those later markets. And if you look at IPO filings for companies over the last five years on our app that are growing in different places, they all have a market cohort strategy where they say, we grow better in these kinds of markets than these other kinds of markets. These are all things that, you know, later stage IPO type companies report on that they inform all the way down the trail. And so the investor and the fundraising process becomes a lot less once you get out of the grant and pitch competition phase of fundraising, it becomes really about this stuff not about do we think the founder is great and do we like the team. That's just a myth. Like these deals generally do not happen um, because of chemistry or because of charisma or things like that. Eventually it comes down to dollars and cents. So those are those are some of the industry level data and metrics that um, that we kind of look at during the fundraising process. And again you can get a taste of all these uh, on our vc.carestone.com site and if you sign up we do deep dives into industries. And, Again, just to shout out Claire because she does, she's a data crunching machine and looks a lot of this stuff. Um, it also saves me from having to do it in every single market, which is what I used to do. So, very, thanks again for all that stuff. It's really good stuff. And then, you know, just to kind of reiterate what I said before, the, it's not just that you raise money locally in a market like Missouri or Louisiana or Tennessee or wherever. You start locally, your network of people that you know are always going to be your strongest supporters. And progressively through the rounds, you're going to move through time. By the time you get to the point where VC funding is really an option, introductions can help. But again, your numbers are going to do the talking. And really, at that point, you need to know, you need to have people on your side that have dealt with VCs from the coast, if that's even an option. But it's not necessarily required. This is just a misbehaved belief. So. You can exit without ever taking a dollar, so a dollar one. I've done it. A lot of my clients have. I mean, a lot of my clients have done it at this point, and it's just something that, as more of these smaller markets start cross pollinating, learning more about what's actually there and what's not, it's something that we can do together. And so it's very kind of exciting, I think, to move into uh, to these phases as as companies and ecosystems get more sophisticated on this stuff. So again, these are uh, the, these are the domains for some of these resources that are there. We're super proud to be a partner with I10 on the ecosystem map. We think that a lot of ecosystems need to start doing more of these kinds of map projects, and then hopefully start informing the process with data. So I know I like covered a ton of stuff very quickly, and I wanted to reserve a lot of time for questions. So if anybody has any questions of me or Mary Louise, please go ahead and fire away. Yes. So my question is, how come the IPO opportunity is not available, or I don't know why the buy some rules and regulation uh, for like small or at the initial stages of the companies that inception? Yeah, so, you know, the reality is that a lot, IPO is a way to access capital, right, from a broad base of people. And in Silicon Valley, the dot-com era and shortly thereafter things like Enron 
created a lot more regulations and a lot more hurdles for companies to go public. And then investors got in their mind various thresholds. So, you know, in 2007, when we used to write in the legal documents the threshold that the investors, uh, you know, wouldn't have to necessarily, they, they always have to approve an IPO, but the thresholds for IPOs used to be like $25 million, $75 million. Then somebody came up with the idea, well, you can't go public unless you're a $100 million company. My personal belief, uh, we're starting to see evidence of this, is that the capital markets are opening more for smaller IPOs. So if you look at like all the recent IPOs that are big and kind of not doing well, we you know we work with them, which was Can, Uber, a lot of these companies that were grow at all costs, Silicon Valley companies, they waited 10 years to become billion dollar mega cap companies. I think we're going to see a trend away from that. I think we're going to go back and see more uh, smaller IPOs. They're going to be a lot. They're right now Silicon Valley is having nothing but meetings about doing direct listings. They're not hiring investment banks. So that's another reason why the IPO market ended up, you had to do such a big one to do it, is that investment banks, there, there aren't that many small investment banks, but they're warned for many years that wanted to do smaller ones and take because they wouldn't make as much fees. So there are a lot of changes. Some of the crowdfunding legal changes have changed that. So, you know, with Regulation A, companies can raise $50 million. There are companies that are doing crowdfunding deals to raise money to market their reg regulation A deals, and then they're trying to go public. But I think conversely, the other trend is that I don't. I think if you're going to market on an IPO now, and why another reason why I'm so excited about non silicon value markets is that the markets are punishing growth at all costs, nonsensical business models. So I think that companies that have started elsewhere that are more capital efficient, I think you'll see renewed interest from in Silicon Valley. I think you know as kind of recession fears. Um, increase again, you'll see VCs hold back a little bit on companies that aren't learning to be profitable earlier. So I, I think, but I, but I, yeah, I think in many ways there are going to be more small IPOs. Our investment banks are getting back into the game. There are people that say we're going to reject the investment bank model. The reality is, and it goes back to the crowdfunding question earlier, um, we, I've done one major crowdfunding deal in the last 10 years. Is for a company called Dinner Lab. If you've ever heard of that, it was like a pop-up dinner group. They were growing on fire. They had 40,000 members in all these different cities, and they did they did a huge crowdfunding deal with their customers. I was covered on the CBS and all these other places. Very cool, exciting deal. They just announced to their customers, "Hey, we're doing a round. Do you want to do it?" And they raised like six million dollars from that. That led to an East Coast VC coming in, filling out another four. Um, but that's hard to pull off, you know. So unless you have if you're a company that has a broad consumer reach already, those are options for you. And, and instead of maybe taking an institutional VC round, you know you can keep more control of the company as a founder if you do one of these other rounds. There's other costs to it, but um, I think that there I, we're seeing more. I, we had another client that did that did a relatively small IPO uh, in the last year too. Um, gaming, like an e-gaming esports company. So I, I think they're happening more again. Um, Hopefully there's not a lot of abuse. The small IPOs got got hit with a lot of bad claims for the last few years. But yeah, I think I think it's opening up, and I think it's a viable option for non silicon value company. Honestly, I really do. So, yes. What's your opinion on some, a lot of the companies that are going public now? Like Lendio or yeah. something like that. You know, I think entrepreneurs need to educate themselves about about about. Uh, I know a lot of companies that basically, I, I don't know Lindy, I don't know anybody that's on Lindia, but, but Cabbage is certainly one that people look at. And I think once they look at the interest rates, I mean, for most startups, it's not like going into debt at a very high interest rate is not a good option. We've had at least one company that did use one of those, and they, um, I mean, they got pursued by the lenders personally because they're signing you know, to personal guarantees. I think if you're going to borrow money to support a startup growth, you need to be really sure that your cash flow is sufficient. Definitely investors, uh, certainly of earlier stage companies, but even later stage companies don't want to see a lot of debt on the balance sheet. But um, certainly it's an option if it makes sense for your case. Well, you can see a lot of them put on a lot on credit cards. you got to assume that they're lower than credit cards. Yeah, I don't know. I haven't compared. Yeah. But I mean, some of the ones that some of these I've seen have. Yeah, I don't know, maybe that's, maybe that's 
one They're a little bit lower, but it's yeah. it's not as low as you would think, that's for sure. Right. Yes. Um, Mayor Luis, you mentioned that uh, Midwest investors have been familiar with those on the coast. Can you share more of your perspective there? Well, I think Mark touched on it, and I think just as far as deal size and things like that, um, and expectations, and, you know, I think Mark mentioned, you know, somebody that's been a very successful entrepreneur on the West Coast and has raised money and had great exits can call somebody up and get millions of dollars on an idea. Um, but that's the kind of the dynamics of that situation and the marketplace. So it's really just understanding. I think Mark told a good story about you know knowing your what your product is, what industry segment and market you're in, and how you know it's really important to, for instance, you know go out and maybe start raising at two hundred fifty thousand, but have really clear metrics tied to that to prove that you you can make this happen and make it work and it's a good investment and then move on to the next round. So it may be more incremental. So just the nature of the market in that regard. Here's, here's an example. Like, uh, I don't, it probably isn't happening today, but if you would go sit in a, a VC pitch room on Sand Hill Road in, in Silicon Valley, if you sat there and you talked about like a realistic path to profitability within a pretty short period of time before you had millions of users and hundred million dollars, that you might get dinged. Like they might be like, we're not even interested in companies. That's like the attitude you will get, and you will not generally find that in the Midwest or the South, where people are like, I don't see how this thing ever works. So you have you have investors when they're looking at investment opportunities to write checks on the West Coast and East Coast. It, venture is such a crowded space now with funds that have to impress giant hedge funds and a lot of other types of investors that for a long time they've been doing nothing but chasing later and later stage deals that are big and they can't really afford to be missing out on some of these deals. I think that's all going to change, or this changing back in the other direction. You, you just never had those kinds of investors anywhere else. Like that's not how people that have wealth in the rest of the country have ever made a lot of their money and it's just not what they look for. Because um, I, I think it's just a different mentality altogether and usually People either investing their own money, or if you look at the LP base for funds, like you know, there. If you look at the investors in the investment funds, it's a much more limited amount of people, and it's it's their personal relationships at stake. So they're going to probably be a little more conservative in terms of the opportunities they put money into, and a little less concerned with the mega deals as opposed to all right, we can get some return. Here. I think that's a good example. Like. It, and, and so it's funny you have you have companies that if they've spent time in both and pitching both, it, it can create more confusion in some ways because you'll know, I'll, I'll see companies that have gone on you know some pitch meetings in the West Coast and the feedback they get is very much different than one here you know or somewhere else and, and so you have to you have to just pick your balance and decide like if you are a company that is doing something that's leading to a really fast crazy growth rate um, maybe you focus on that. But aside from the individual pitch meetings, they tend to push companies on the West Coast to a totally different cost framework in London. So I had a great company a few years ago that I was working with that did you know, a couple million dollars in seed rounds, uh, various seed rounds from individual investors. In the South, they were on the way to profit very quickly. A VC, top name brand on the West Coast came in. They said, you gotta move to San Francisco, if you can't prove it here, you can't prove it anywhere, no one's gonna care, we have all our connections here. The same, the same stuff they've done everybody. And then all of a sudden the company had to spend exponentially more on employees, on marketing dollars, et cetera. And that fund really couldn't continue to support follow-on investments in its portfolio that were not Airbnb and the other major companies. So once you have a Silicon Valley investor, VC who does not do your follow-on round, it's hard to convince anybody else that, that you're good to go. So, you know, for as much as I hear companies say, like, investors here don't get it, and I want to go out west and get it, and I don't need to do all this stuff. In reality, I think the, the, it's smart to build your business with a different set of movies. I think the market will that. At least temporary until the next wave. <laughs> Yes. Um, you've seen in the last couple of months a pickup of non-solicited uh, asking for funding. Has there been any major change in crowdsourcing or anything else in the last few months 
I've gotten a couple more. It seems to be big enough tough I can do for this. I didn't read all the details. Is there any, been any major change in, in well, those regulations? I, I should I should be here and have been really on top of it, but I think when when the 506 C general solicitation rules came out, I saw a, a big in, uptick in those and that dinner appeal I was talking about, that was one of those and we had some clients with a lot of success. All of the other deals, like under regulation CF and a lot of these other mechanisms, it just I guess maybe I've formed some bias against them as a realistic strategy because if you, like, I just believe that if you don't have more users than you're likely to get as investors in one of those deals, there's a lot of noise, right? Like, I don't know you or if you're an active investor generally, but I think everybody gets these things and you get lost in the fray. So, I don't know to tell you the truth. There may have been some changes uh, to some of the, the crowdfunding stuff, but it's not, it's not been a successful strategy for our deals. So you got walked on a little bit by the notes. Is there been a, I heard it, no change. Yeah. Is it just a matter of more acceptance, more not, you know, more word getting out a little, or? Yeah, I, I, I don't know. I haven't, I, I, I have not gotten uptake in personal solicitations. So uh, I don't know if I'm just using my spam filter better these days or, or not, but, you know, like AngelList, when, that, when crowdfunding really started going, I was getting a ton of solicitations on AngelList. Um, I wasn't getting, I got some direct, and I still do get some direct, things, but I, I don't know. I, I couldn't explain. I don't know if there's been any changes in the last like, few months. I really don't know. That, I, I, most of the deals, um, and I, I don't know, we could probably see. I don't, most of these deals are just not happening. Uh, and then something about crowdfunding to be aware of is there's a lot of deals that are watching the money roll in. Um, people that have been successful using that platform, um, they have done, just like when you're trying to raise money, they have done significant work before that even um, was launched. And I'm talking about marketing work. So they did, they develop marketing <coughs> programs um, to promote them and get their name out there to cut through the noise. It is, it isn't just like go through the paperwork and get your, you know, get you know posted on the platform it is something that you need to plan for and manage and it's a it's a significant marketing effort and so and, and there's a lot of work that has to happen before during and then during and um, to, you know and that's companies that have been successful at it and have done that work and it's nothing as easy as, as it appears <laughs> and it's kind of like a chicken or egg problem like if you have enough money to make a crowdfunding campaign work wouldn't you be better off spending that money on user growth or revenue growth? I mean, it take pot to be successful at crowdfunding before you have tens of thousands at least of users is, it, I've just not seen it actually work in practice. I'm not saying it hasn't. And there might be uh, providers out there that, you know, help you run a campaign successfully. <coughs> I just haven't worked with any companies that have done it. We've just done it old fashioned way. And then when companies have reached the scale, they have sometimes said, like, we're getting so many users asking if they can invest in our business. We should just do it and see what happens, and that has worked. But I think to put the chicken before the egg, so that's what I'm saying. There are companies, we haven't had a number of conversations, we haven't had many actually do it, but we have had conversations that with companies, again, that have, you know, once I think they get to, like, 50,000 plus active users, then they've said, all right, we think a number of these are actually, like, tracking us as potential investment can raise some money to then fund a big crowdfunding campaign, which they usually have told me they budget several hundred thousands of dollars just to get the word out and get and make it effective. But look, if you're doing crowdfunding too, um, I would say the majority of companies that have come to me asking about crowdfunding strategy haven't really invested significantly in their in their corporate documents either. And if once you do a crowdfunding deal of any kind, you're going to have and you're going to have pretty significant reporting obligations that are more involved than like if you do a private deal. So it, it just ends up being, I think a lot of people want it to be a way out of venture capital, but it just rarely is, at least for me and companies that way, unfortunately. 
But I do think it has made, for companies that are further along in the process, I think it's given them better exit options that don't require a VC file. Well, I want to be respectful. We were on tight schedules here. I want to be respectful of the next session. So I want to take a moment to thank Claire and Mark for supporting I-10 and being here today and talking with all of you. Um, so I'll just ask, um, thank you both very much. Thank you. Appreciate it.